This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. Hi, I'm Seth. And I'm Patrick. Chapter 28 of The Shadow Rising. To the Tower of Genjai. And our symbol is the wolf. Now, am I saying that right? Genjai? That's how I think it's pronounced I'm in the audio. Does books. anyone want to yell at us about that, or does that seem correct? I said Genji for so many years, but Genjai makes sense. Otherwise, you would, really wouldn't need that extra vowel at the end. Genjai is one possibility, but... Uh, Genjai, I could see that. Again, sticking with the audiobooks, Genjai is the pronunciation. Cool. that's what we'll do then. To the Tower of Genjai. With night so near, they had no choice but to camp there on the mountain near the Waygate. In two camps, Fael insisted on it. That is done with, Wyle told her in a displeased rumble. We are out of the ways, and I have kept my oath. It is finished. Fael put on one of her stubborn expressions, with chin up and fists on hips. Leave it alone, Loyal, Perrin said. I'll camp over there a bit. Loyal glanced at Fael, who turned to the two Aiel women, as soon as she heard Perrin agree, then shook his huge head and made as if to join Perrin in Gaul. Perrin motioned him back, with a small gesture he none of the women noticed. He made it a small bit, less than twenty paces. The waygate might be locked, but there were still the ravens, and whatever they might presage. Am I getting that word right? Presage? Oh, it can be presage as well. Both are correct, apparently. Presage or presage. Anyway, sorry. He made it a small bit, less than twenty paces. The waygate might be locked, but there were still the ravens, and whatever they might presage. He wanted to be near if needed. If Fayil complained, she could just complain. He was so set to ignore her protests that it irked him when she made none. Disregarding twinges from his leg and side, he unsaddled Stepper and unloaded the pack horse, hobbled both animals and fitted them with nose bags with a few handfuls of barley and some oats. There was certainly no grazing up here. As to what there was, though, he strung his bow and laid it across his quiver near the fire, slipped the axe free of its belt loop. Gaul joined him in making a fire, and they had a meal of bread and cheese and dried beef, eaten in silence and washed down with water. The sun slid behind the mountains, silhouetting the peaks and painting the undersides of the clouds red. Shadows blanketed the valley, and the air began to grow crisp. Dusting crumbs from his hands, Perrin dug his good green wool cloak out of his saddlebags. Perhaps he had grown more accustomed to tears' heat than he had thought. The women were certainly not eating in silence around their shadowed fire. He could hear them laughing, and the bits of what they said that he picked up made his ears burn. Women would talk about anything. They had no restraint at all. What do you think they're talking about there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Something probably vaguely sexual or spanking. I think it's spanking. <laughs> I think that we just saw in the last chapter that there was a certain reaction that Fael had, a consideration that she had after being turned over parents' knee. <laughs> And now they're talking about things that make parents' ears burn. Hmm. Hmm. Lael had moved as far away from them as he could and still be in the light, and he was trying to bury himself in a book. They probably did not even realize they were embarrassing the oak ear. They probably thought they were talking quietly enough for Lael not to hear. I also kind of wanted to note that probably the only people who can hear them are, I mean, I, I don't think Gaul can hear. Lael can hear. No, no. Well, Loyal's sitting at their fire. He's only a couple of feet away right. from them, and he has very good hearing. So they probably don't think Perrin can hear them, and I would like to think that, yeah, that they're all giggling because Fael's like, mm, I think I liked that. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Are we at the point now, <clears throat> we know Fael knows he has good eyes, but does she know he has good ears? I don't think he does. I don't think that he has shared that yet. I think that's something that she knows quite yet. She may suspect. Yeah, she has made a comment about the eyes before, or about his sight, but not his hearing. Perrin's pretty quiet about it. He doesn't, he doesn't like to highlight this stuff. I mean, he deliberately hides it when, in any way possible. He's always trying to hide his extra abilities. I kind of like that Leia here is saying that she thinks, Fael, Fael thinks that Perrin can hear her and doesn't care. I would like to believe that. I don't know if it's true or not, but I, I would like to believe that. I want to say I think there's a scene later where she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how well you can hear. Just like we saw there was a scene where she was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how well you can see. Yeah. I think there's going to be a similar scene later, but I can't 
I don't have it off the tip of my tongue, so maybe I'm wrong. He's overhearing all these things, and so he turns to Gaul and says, tell me a funny story. And Gaul's like, I don't really know any. And Perrin's like, ha, 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 that's so funny. That's so asinine. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, we're having fun over here, too. And then immediately sits down and... And slumps. Gaul's like, yes, I've read texts of this fun Again, this is just the childish one-upsmanship. We're, we're, we're having fun over here, too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's totally what's happening, though. I'm going to read this little bit because I was talking a little bit in the last episode. <laughs> Perrin does that, and then it's just, there's Gaul's just silent. And <laughs> after a moment, Gaul said, This place begins to look more like the threefold land than most of the wetlands. Too much water still, and the trees are still too big and too many but it is not so strange as the places called forests. The soil was poor here, where Menethrin had died in fire, the widely scattered trees all stunted and thick bold, odd wind-bent shapes, none as much as thirty feet high. Perrin thought about it as desolate a spot as he had ever seen. I wish I could see your threefold land some day, Gaul. Perhaps you will, when we are done here. Perhaps. Not much chance of it, of course, Perrin thinks, because he believes he's going to die in a couple of days be slaughtered by the White Cloaks as a sacrifice in order to keep his family safe. Not that it would work. Uh, well, not that it would work, but you know, hey, why not? Go ahead and give it a shot. When you're, It's not the greatest reasoning, but I can see where he thinks that's all he can do. But everyone around him is like, mm, that wouldn't do you any good anyway. Right, he seems to kind of dumb. think that the White Cloaks will act as honorably as he will in this yeah. Right. I guess that's really where it, what it comes down to is he like thinks that the white cloaks are honorable, which is just like kind of a silly thing to think. It's kind of a silly belief, right? Like And it kind of goes back to we were talking a, a little bit about this in the last episode with the, the cultural misunderstandings between Fail and Perrin where everybody kind of believes that everyone else understands the world in the same way they do, right? Like you right. live in the same world that I do, so how could it be any? How could we be experiencing anything different? Which is ridiculous, but it is hard to wrap your head around sometimes that everybody else is having their own unique experiences all the time. They don't actually. Well, the way I always say it Empathy. is, they don't live in the same world you do. You live in totally different worlds. You just happen to be interfacing occasionally. <laughs> right, right. Your world is all in your head, and their world is all in their head, and occasionally they interact. Right. And and sometimes reality intrudes, but that is rare. <laughs> That's particularly <laughs> Let's rare be honest. these days. <laughs> uh, but Perrin and Gaul here have kind of a, a little bit of a conversation about Manetherin. Perrin's like, oh, do you know about Manetherin? And yes, I am, I suppose, descended from the blood of Manetherin and... Of the Gaul old talks blood. about he's like yes I've you know I've read a lot of books about your part half of the world and I do know more than most wetlanders seem to think of the history and and all that yeah he's I mean Gaul is well read and that's something that I, I think we doesn't come up a lot we think a lot of the about the savage Aiel but they are consumers of books avid consumers of books almost all Aiel can read as far as I can tell it is. A surprisingly literate group of people for the kind of era that they live in. It's just that books seem hard to get. They're hard to they're hard to create and they're hard to Yeah, I can't I can't expensive. imagine why paper pulp is hard to get in the waste from trees. <laughs> and paper's heavy as hell. Like that's the other thing, like it's hard to maintain. Carrying it's, books. Yeah. yeah. But the, we do know that the society, the Aiel society, is pretty heavily, you know, we don't think about it a lot, but it's heavily regulated. It's this military, militarized society guided by a united group of wise ones. And so, you know, at some point they must have made it clear that literacy was a priority. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it is kind of a surprise that it's such a literate place. Everybody seems to be able to read and do basic math. So Perrin shares the, the vision of the arrow and the ravens right that he that he saw that and basically says i'm gonna go see if i can figure some stuff out and you may have some trouble waking me up yeah this is right after gall says what of the night runner and leaf blighters get do you believe it's just a coincidence that they came so near this way gate no perrin sighed and he says saw ravens down in the valley 
and that may be all that that was but i don't really i'm not planning on taking the chance i think the arrow makes it something more yeah and gall nods and says they could have been shadow eyes if you plan for the worst all surprises are pleasant <laughs> uh, that's like that's very much like the most pessimistic attitude you can ever take <laughs> like oh well you just assume assume the worst and then you then you're pleasantly surprised it's great <laughs> It I, it sings to me. Sings sweet screams. <laughs> and Perrin goes on here and says, Gull, you've never mentioned my eyes or given them a second glance. And I get it. There's yeah, kind of a long conversation here where Perrin and Gull are kind of getting to know each other. Yeah, I mean, this the, this is the buddy comedy that we all wanted and deserved in The Wheel of Time, which is the Gull-Perrin, like, murder duo. Oh, hey, Bales and Monkey just made good observation as we were talking about literacy in Ranland and the Aiel Waste, that history is also magically stored. So there are Terangriel that have preserved language and writing. So it, it would be difficult to, it can't be forgotten, really. Or it's much less likely to be. Sure. I mean, I wonder how much of the writing is preserved in there. I mean, I guess technically there are books in the visions, but I don't think anyone like reads them. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I I mean, I think you can make an argument that, that that might be one of the things that helps preserve the language down through time and, and keeps it from changing. That there are records. Because some of those visions occur during the Age of Legends when everyone must be speaking the old tongue. But since you're seeing it from their perspective, you understand the language. That's true, too. And one would assume that, that you don't even need... That, that since you just hear it in your own language, you wouldn't hear the, the old tongue as it's being spoken. You just sort of understand the translation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Gaul and Perrin have this little chat, and basically Gaul says, like, I, I suppose I can read some of this. This is a short chapter. Might as well go for it. Perrin says, Gaul, you've never mentioned my eyes or even given them a second glance. None of the Aiel have. The world is changing, Gaul said quietly. Ruark and Jaren, my own clan chief, the wise ones too, they tried to hide it, but they were uneasy when they sent us across the dragon wall, searching for he who comes with the dawn. I think perhaps the change will not be what we have always believed. I do not know how it will be different, but it will be. The Creator put us in the threefold land to shape us, as well as punish us, for our sin. But for what have we been shaped? He shook his head suddenly, ruefully. Kalinda, the wise one of Hot Springs Hold, tells me I think too much for a stone dog, and Bear... The eldest wise one of the Sharad threatens to send me to Ruidian when Jaren dies, whether I want to go or not. Beside all of that, Perrin, what does a, the color of a man's eyes matter? I wish everybody thought that way, Perrin says. And then he kind of dismisses himself, saying, I'm going to lay down and go to sleep. You might have to kick me awake if anything happens. Remember to kick me awake. <laughs> and Gull's like, yeah, sure. It's a nice little message on uh, racism. What does it matter, the color of a man's eyes or skin? Yeah, it, it, it doesn't. We should all learn from Gaul. I think of Gaul and Telmanis as sort of the second to Perrin and uh, Matt. The sort of slightly sarcastic but serious quirky secondaries that are just like really fun personalities but aren't really big characters. Telmanis is kind of Matt's Gaul. Talmanis is to Matt as Gaul is to Perrin. Yeah. As Lewis Theron is to Rand. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> In a creepy way. Yeah. The, his second, who's always with him and has an odd sense of humor. It was daylight, and he stood alone near the waygate, which looked like an elegantly carved length of wall, incongruous on the mountainside, except for that there was no sign of any human, that any human had ever set foot on that slope. The sky was bright and fine, and a soft breeze up the valley brought him the scent of deer and rabbits, quail and dove, a thousand distinct smells of water and earth and trees. This was the wolf dream. For a moment, the sense of being a wolf rolled over him. He had paws and, no, he ran his hands over himself, relieved to find only his own body, in his own coat and cloak, and the wide belt that normally held his axe, but with the hammer half thrust through the loop instead. He frowned at that, and surprisingly... For a moment, the axe flickered there instead, insubstantial and misty. Abruptly, it was the hammer again. Licking his lips, he hoped it stayed that way. The axe might be a better weapon, but he preferred the hammer. He could not remember anything like that happening before, something changing. 
but he knew little of this strange place, if it could be called a place. It was the wolf dream, and odd things happened here, surely as odd as in any ordinary dream. As though thinking of the oddities triggered one of them, a patch of sky against the mountains darkened suddenly, became a window to somewhere else. Rand stood amid swirling storm winds, laughing wildly, even madly, arms upraised, and on the winds rode small shapes, gold and scarlet, like the strange figure on the dragon banner. Hidden eyes watched Rand, and there was no telling whether he knew it. Obviously, Rand coming out of Rudian and fighting the the dragons on the, the bubble of evil that basically are formed out of the mist, and also the dragons forming on his arms. Yeah, and these, I believe there were three visions that Perrin sees are all very much prescient. They're insights into what is happening right now. Right, right. They're not necessarily future visions, but present visions. Right. And I think we hear the wise ones say it's much easier to see the present in Teleron Riyadh than it is to see the future. I think they, they tell that to um, Rain. Oh, that's right. Since we just heard that, it's even more of a clue that these are present visions, not future visions. Um, what I'm, I'm thinking about the timeline now, and, and the, this, these things might happen a few days from now. Well, at, at least the one with Rand, if not right now. It's not the deep future. It's like this week, <laughs> you know? I, I think it's like what's going on with those people. More or less currently. Right yeah. now, wherever they are. Yeah, more or less currently. And yeah, Perrin just totally just ignores them. He's like, oh, yeah, visions. Okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next one. The odd window winked out, only to, to be replaced by another farther over, where Nynaeve and Elaine stalked cautiously through a demented landscape of twisted, shadowed buildings, hunting some dangerous beast. Perrin could not have said how he knew it was dangerous, but he did. And so they're heading to Tanchico to hunt down the Black yeah. Aja. So that beast is, is the Black Aja, whatever representation of it. In the first vision, somebody's watching Rand. Who do you think oh. that is? I assumed it was Lanfear. <laughs> I did too. Yeah, yeah. yeah She's okay. always watching that creeper. No. <laughs> and and we know that she shows up in the waste, and Ishmael was the other one who was watching, and he's dead. So, yeah, I think Lanfear is the only. Candidate. Yeah, in theory, we, you know, I could probably expound on that and say maybe it's one or two other people or things or whatever. But I I think it's. Pr- I could see an argument for like Fane or. And and Lanfear has very much been the unseen eyes a bunch of times in the past. Yeah, that's kind of her yeah. role. She likes to be the face in the window. Right. And the third, Matt standing where a road forked ahead of him. He flipped a coin, started down one branch, and suddenly he was wearing a wide-brimmed hat and walking with a staff bearing a short sword blade. I always assumed that was the coin flip that put him into the first red stone way door frame Terong Riel. Oh, I thought it was the second because he flips the coin, walks through, and he's got the the hat and the Well, okay, so there's there's two coin flips. There's the one because he doesn't flip a coin before going through the second doorway. Oh no, not for the doorway, yeah. Yeah. So the first leads him to the second, but he flips a coin to go through the that first. That makes a sense and then because he goes through the first, he learns that he must go through the second. So Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Oh, and there there is a fourth. It's another window, and Egwene and a woman with long white hair were staring at him in surprise. While behind them, the white tower crumbled stone by stone. Then they were gone too. And so I think he's actually seeing Amis and Egwene in the dream, and they they actually comment later that they saw him. Ah. So this is actually them in the dream seeing him as well. It's one of those th- times where they actually see each other randomly in the world of dreams and then of course behind them the white tower is crumbling well we're about to see the amaran seat be overthrown yeah like as we're talking she's about to get overthrown it's about to split so i you know that's that's the prophecy part any day now yeah and i like the idea that is it a and a i believe so white hair there's other there's other women with white hair, but they're generally old women with white hair. Whereas if you're talking about just a woman with white hair, not like I just kind of enjoyed, I guess, the idea that Amis and Egwene are meeting in the world of dreams so she can do her lessons, and that they're in the waste somewhere, and she's like, "This is how you open up 
this window thing and see what's going on like in the world or you know this is how you use this tool and they open it and parents just looking at them through this <laughs> but they do it at the same time you know yeah yeah, yeah. no they're, they're, it's like two people looking through a keyhole yeah <laughs> like into a room and they, they like see each other's eyes through yeah. the keyhole and it's like <laughs> what 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 are you doing there i don't know what are you doing there nothing <laughs> <laughs> nothing Right after this, Perrin wishes he could talk to Elias about all this stuff and try to learn more. Sure. Who probably does know a lot, but we really don't get very much out of him for the rest of the series, pretty much. No, he does pop into the dream to help Perrin out occasionally. Yeah. In the last battle. Yeah. But he talks about the fact that he avoids the world of dreams. It just it it's something he's not interested in, in dealing with. He knows it's dangerous. And he knows it's part of the part of being a wolf, but it's not something, you know, it, it, in one way, it's how Elias is more man than wolf, is he avoids the wolf. Mm. Perrin runs around yelling for Hopper because he doesn't know where his teacher is. And he can't find any wolves at all, which is freaking him out. So he starts yelling for Hopper, who usually shows up when Perrin calls him in the world of dreams, but he does not at first. The lack of wolves is entirely due to Slayer killing them. Right. All. Or at least scaring them away. Right, any that have left have either fled or been killed. I feel I feel like there's a little bit of like intro to Teleron Riyadh for Perrin. Mm-hmm. For the girls, they're always thinking about different dresses, different clothes. Like their appearance changes constantly. Constantly with Perrin, rock solid. <laughs> the only thing that flickers is the axe on his. And belt. sometimes he changes to a wolf and back. I suppose there is that, but for him, like his self image is so set in stone. That it almost doesn't change at all. But his self-image is also so tied up in his weapon that that's what flickers. I like that. Perrin knows who he is, Felleron says. Yeah, and he's a, I like, he's a natural. He's, he is an instinctive wolf. He uses Teleron Riyadh by instinct. He doesn't really have to learn the rules. Or at least he sees them the way a wolf would see them, not the way a human would. Yeah, and you're right. The next couple of paragraphs are kind of Perrin looking around. He's looking for like signs of the archer that he saw earlier which is obviously not here and he wouldn't be able to find that anyway and then he starts jumping he's still calling for hopper but he's jumping from like mountain peak to mountain peak looking all around searching for any signs of anything anything he can learn he's sort of figuring out basic navigation yeah particularly he's look. he wants to find wolves so that he can get information from them but there are none he leaped to the next mountain, calling, and the next, and the next, eastward toward the two rivers. Hopper did not answer. More troubling, Perrin did not sense any other wolves either. There were always wolves in the wolf dream. Always. And he keeps going for a long time. We see, from his point of view here, a couple of old relics from Anetherin. There's like some giant statues carved into the mountains, and a perfectly flat cliff with... that's carved with strange angular letters two spans high he doesn't know what they say i would assume it's all monethrin remnants but you know it could even be from earlier doesn't have to be that's true it could be older than that even but i I don't have any insight into you know if that represents anything in particular or anyone in particular it's just yeah there's there's ancient ruins all over the place then mountains and cliffs gave way to the sand hills great rolling mounds sparsely covered with tough grass and stubborn bushes once the shore of a great sea, before the breaking. And suddenly, he saw another man, atop a sandy hill. The fellow was too distant to see clearly. Just a tall, dark-haired man, but plainly not a trollic, or anything of the sort, in a blue coat, with a bow on his back, stooping over something on the ground hidden by the low brush. Yet, there was something familiar about him. The wind rose, and Perrin caught his smell faintly. A cold scent, that was the only way to describe it, cold, and not really human. Suddenly, his own bow was in his hand. An arrow knocked, and the weight of a filled quiver tugged at his belt. The other man looked up, saw Perrin. For a heartbeat, he hesitated, then turned and became a streak, slashing away across the hills. Perrin leapt down to where he had stood, stared at what had occupied the fellow, and without thought, pursued, leaving the half-skinned corpse of a wolf behind. A dead wolf, in the wolf dream, it was unthinkable. What could kill a wolf here? Something evil. So there's quite a bit in there, specifically about his appearance. We see him, we see Slayer as a tall, dark-haired man, 
And yet we, when we encounter Lord Luke later, we see him as sort of a red gold haired, you know, very Andorish hair color right. man. And of course we know that's because Slayer is the merging of two people. Um, so the person he's seeing now in the dream is Isam because Isam is the one who really likes to hunt the wolves. Whereas Lord Luke likes to be around people. And we know he can switch back and forth, at least in the dream. But I think he can come out of the dream as either one. My understanding is that he cannot switch in the real world. That he has to go into the dream. And then when he's in the dream, he can picture himself either as Lord Luke or as Isom. And then come out of the dream as that person. Gotcha. But that was that's very headcanon. I don't have great evidence for that. But my, my understanding is that either one... Because you can't just change your appearance in the real world, but if you're going into the dream in the flesh and your mind takes over, kind of the way, you know how we see Rand and LTT fight it out during the battle against Ravine in the world yeah. of dreams? I sort of think of it like that, where as the different man takes over, as the different soul takes over, the different body appears. And it doesn't, you know, it's, it's something that can only be done at the bore. The merging of their souls was very much a violation of the pattern. It was taking two threads and weaving them together. Stuff's not supposed to work this way. Not supposed to work that way. And so it does, it violates causality and reality in a bunch of different ways. In that you have two bodies and two souls in one person. Yes. Two identities. Talk about really hoping you get along with your roommate. <laughs> really stuck together. He did catch the smell of Slayer, and I believe that cold smell, and I think I've talked about this before, is the result of Slayer going into the world of dreams repeatedly in the flesh. And when the wise ones and the wolves talk about you know, being there in the flesh as being something that's evil, I think what you end up with is someone like Slayer, who somehow loses something that makes him human, something that gives him personality and passion and empathy and makes him just want to kill everything yeah something does happen there we've talked about that a little bit I, I don't know i hope i hope we get a little more on that in the future or figure out some some more about that entering the world of dreams in the flesh does seem to be problematic but we don't really understand exactly why or how that works i guess i should say oh your tendencies is asking why isn't there more versions of slayer why aren't there more just like male dreamers or more merged souls? Take two two people, put them in one body. Because, I mean, he's super effective. He can teleport anywhere. Yeah. Oh, more gains asked that. Sorry. Uh, I would. Th so, all right. Here's my theory is that whatever the Dark One did to Slayer gives him the ability to create the Dark Hounds and that he only has one of those abilities and so he can only give it to one person and that person will eventually lead the wild hunt hmm or is it the last hunt is that what the wolves call it the i think it's the wild hunt okay well well the, the wolves call it the last hunt the wolves call the last battle the last hunt and then there's the wild hunt which is what is led by old grim i see i see you know what that makes me wonder about you know how there there are there are two different kinds of dark hounds right they're like the superpowered ones and regular ones. I wonder if that has anything to do with Slayer. That maybe he creates the superpowered ones and the, or maybe not the as good ones or uh, who knows. I don't, you know. I, I was thinking he creates the superpower ones and they infect other wolves and create the crappier ones. Yeah, I kind of dig that. Originals. He he creates the carriers of the disease and then the the not as good wolves are the. What I'm thinking is that like the. Slayer is not the first person who's been able to create Dark Hounds, but the Dark One can only give that ability to one person at a time. Yeah, I think it would also, you know, just considering how rare a dreamer is, and to make Slayer, you would need the Shadow has to capture, at least the Shadow has to at least capture a dreamer. It would be much better if they could get a dreamer who is also a Dark Friend. But how many dreamers are even alive in the world? Like ten. Or was it? I don't think Slayer was a dreamer before he got his souls merged. I think dreaming is a side effect of having the souls. Merged. Oh, really? I had just assumed. I had just always assumed that one of them was, and so no, 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 no. Because they both, both Perrin and Slayer, gain the ability to access the Wolf Dream through having merged souls. That's 
somehow that is what gives you the ability to access the wolf dream. Hmm. And so by merging the souls, the Dark One gave the ability to access Teleron Riyadh to Isam. The, the theory is that Perrin, Perrin has a human soul and a wolf soul. And so there's kind of two at the same time. Perrin has emerged. So he, you know, one would say that when he became a wolf brother, when his eyes turned golden, his soul merged with that of a wolf. And, and that's what gave him access to Teleron Riyadh. Which I think is possibly purely a Watt spoilers theory, but I buy it because it works with so many other things, including Luke and Isam becoming Slayer. I, the Merge Souls thing, I feel like, is when, when we're hearing Isam or Luke talk about his abilities, he says, you know, I wanted to learn to channel. Luke, at least, is saying, I wanted the ability to channel, and I went to the Dark One, and he couldn't give that, but he gave me something else instead. Yeah. And Isam went to the Dark One just because he wanted to hunt better, basically, because he was raised in the town in the Blight, and so he just wanted more power. Yeah, but yeah, I don't, regardless, I think it's just something that's it's very hard to do. You have to get to willing people, presumably willing people, into... Uh, oh my god, I keep almost saying Shatter Logoth, but that's not what I mean. I mean um, Shael Ghoul. And this procedure has to be done by the Dark One himself. So it's just not something that's going to happen a lot. Oh, and I, I do think Perrin was born with the merged soul. He didn't, like, merge souls of the wolf when he went out into the world. It's not like, well, I think he just, he was born with a merged soul and going out into the world allowed that to come out. So he's following Slayer as they long step across the world. Yeah, I, I tend to call it jumping, but it's not really jumping. It's just each stride of the run is like, takes them a mile or something. It's almost like anime teleporting, like where, you know, the guy's running and they don't want to like do the frames in between. And then they leap and go really far. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> and then it's like the cheap animation style, and it's like, yes, we teleport. That's way cheaper than actually showing them running from one place to another. Perfect. They leap, and the background blurs, and then they land wherever they're going to be because exactly. the and budget then their is mouth low. Moves and they talk. <laughs> Paying animators is expensive. My my favorite is the fights where it's like, and I attack you, and they just like show a streak of light. <laughs> And do yeah. a sound effect. <laughs> and it's like, attack! <laughs> and it's, oh my gosh, you're me battling. <laughs> uh, no, there's a, there's definitely an anime flavor to Perrin and Slayer's fights in the in the world of dreams. Especially when they start doing the thing where they teleport each, behind each other, trying to hit each other. Yeah. Very anime. They're chasing each other, and I'll read this little part as a kind of intro. Then something glittered ahead, sparkling in the sun, a tower of metal. His quarry sped straight for it and vanished. Two leaps brought Perrin there as well. Two hundred feet, the tower rose, and forty thick, gleaming like burnished steel. It might as well have been a solid column of metal. Perrin walked around it twice without seeing any opening, not so much as a crack, not even a mark on that smooth, sheer wall. The smell hung here, though, that cold, inhuman stink. The trail ended here. The man, if man he was, had gone inside somehow. He only had to find the way to follow. And then Hopper shows up yelling at him. Do not go in there. It's a trap. All right, so do you think Slayer goes into the Tower of Genjai? Or do you think he either teleports away or teleports to the real world instead and is trying to trick Perrin to go into the Tower of Genjai? Because it's impossible to get back out again. I'm going to go with the second one. Slayer's clever and powerful. Maybe he could go into the Tower of Genjai and come back out. But why would he when he can just leave? He could just go to the other side of the world. I, I assume that he is not able to get into the Tower of Genjai. That it's just like either a deceptive thing. He's just running away and making it seem like that's where he goes. But I think he just steps into the real world. And Perrin doesn't even know that's possible. Yeah. Because he doesn't understand that he's there in the flesh. Hopper explains here, uh, this is where we get the name Slayer. Hopper says, you chase Slayer, young bull. He is here in the flesh, and he can kill. In the flesh? You mean not just dreaming? How can he be, in, be here in the flesh? I do not know. It is a thing dimly remembered from long ago. Come again, as so much else. Things of the shadow walk the dream now. Creatures of heart fang. There is no safety. Perrin believes he's inside. 
And of course, from Hopper, we get a kind of analogy of cub digging around in a gro- ground wasp's nest. It's like, you idiot, don't stick your nose in there. If the wasps <laughs> look like snakes and foxes. Right. <laughs> and then I have I have a long read here. That's a bit of Perrin talking to Hopper a little bit more, and then Brigida shows up and really gives us some information. Brigida says you can enter the tow- Tower of Genjai in the dream, but it's even harder to get out in the dream than it is in the real world. And since she, we know she died in there in the real world, uh, she means that seriously. Yeah. Uh, that that's one of my favorite quotes where she's like yeah i i went in there well how'd you get out i didn't i died foolish cub digging in a ground wasp's nest this place is evil all know this and you would chase evil into evil slayer can kill perrin paused there was a sense of finality to the emotions his mind attached to the word kill hopper what happens to a wolf that dies in the dream the wolf was silent for a time if we die here we die forever, young bull. I do not know if the same is true for you, but I believe it is. A dangerous place, Archer. The Tower of Genjai is a bad place for humankind. Perrin whirled, half raising his bow before he saw the woman standing a few paces away, her golden hair and a thick braid to her waist, almost the way women wore it in the two rivers, but more intricately woven. Her clothes were oddly cut, a short white coat, and voluminous trousers of some thin, pale yellow material gathered at the ankles above short boots. Her dark cloak seemed to hide something that glinted silver at her side. She shifted, and the metallic flicker vanished. You have sharp eyes, Archer. I thought that the first time I saw you. How long had she been watching? It was embarrassing that she had sneaked up on him without him hearing. At least Hopper should have warned him. The wolf was lying down in the knee-high grass, muzzle on his forepaws, watching him. The woman seemed vaguely familiar, though Perrin was certain he would have remembered her had he ever seen her before. Who was she to be in the wolf dream? Or was it Moraine's Teleran Riad, too? Are you as said I? No, Archer, she laughed. I only came to warn you, despite the prescripts. Once entered, the Tower of Genjai is hard enough to leave in the world of men. Here, it is all but impossible. You have a bannerman's courage, which some say cannot be told from foolhardiness. Impossible to leave. The fellow, Slayer, surely had gone in. Why would he do that if he could not leave? Hopper said it's dangerous too. The Tower of Genjai? What is it? Her eyes widened. She glanced at Hopper, who still lay stretched out in the grass, ignoring her and watching Perrin. You can talk to wolves? Now that is a thing long lost in legend. So that is how you are here. I should have known. The Tower? It is a doorway, Archer, to the realms of the Elfin and Elfin. She said the names as if he should recognize them. When he looked at her blankly, she said, Did you ever play the game called Snakes and Foxes? All children do. At least they do in the two rivers. But they give it up when they're old enough to realize there's no way to win. Except to break the rules, she said. Courage to strengthen, fire to blind, music to daze, iron to bind. That's a line from the game. I don't understand. What does it have to do with this tower? Those are the ways to win against the snakes and foxes. The game is a remembrance of old dealings. It does not matter, so long as you stay away from the Elfin and Elfin. They are not evil in the way the Shadow is evil, yet they are so different from humankind they might as well be. They are not to be trusted, Archer. Stay clear of the Tower of Genjai. Avoid the world of dreams if you can. Dark things walk. Like the man I was chasing? Slayer? A good name for him. The Slayer is not old, Archer, but his evil is ancient. She almost appeared to be leaning slightly on something invisible, perhaps that silver thing he had never quite seen. I seem to be telling you a great deal. I do not understand why I spoke in the first place. Of course. Are you Tavarin, Archer? I mean, just everything from Hopper telling Perrin, if we die here, we die in the real, we die forever. Which is, I think, it's the first time we learn that piece of information. Right. He notices something silver gleaming at her side a couple of times. We know that's Brigitte's silver bow. Right. And as we know, and Hopper is like not warning him that she's there because he can't see her at all. Right. So as far as he knows, Perrin's just like chittering at the air. He's like, well, stupid humans. In a moment, Perrin's like, Hopper, where did she go? And Hopper's like, what are you talking about? You're just mumbling into the wind. I didn't understand any of it. (laughs) And that woman seems very familiar because Perrin fought with her 
at Falma against the Sean Chan. Oh, yeah. They've straight up seen each other before. Totally. And, like, I think in context, he doesn't really understand. He wouldn't get it. And, like, that was a little bit of a dream state battle. Everything was very foggy and weird. Yes. So it's kind of understandable that he wouldn't recognize her, even a relatively short time later. And a lot's happened. That's true. Been a while. And Cody's getting at something that I kind of wanted to get out, too, that... Birgitta calls Slayer, says of Slayer, that although he is a young man, he is an ancient evil. And I, I thought that kind of played in, might play into what we were talking about a bit before, where, you know, perhaps Slayer is not a common construct or whatever you want to call him, but it's this isn't the first time this has happened. No, definitely not. And Birgitta seems aware of that, that this was a thing that used to exist in the past. And Slayer may be the first of this kind to exist in a long time, but it's not unknown that this can be done, or things like him can be made. And that feeds into the idea that maybe somehow the Dark Hounds have been created by Slayer, or somehow he is required to create Dark Hounds, because there are older, bigger Dark Hounds that may have been created in the past, and just through time have aged and become more powerful. Maybe the less powerful ones are the newer ones. I can think of a lot of uh, things like that. Yeah. Leah asks, why don't the wolves see Brigida? And I would say it's just because Brigida doesn't want to be seen. She has the abilities of a dreamwalker, the master of Teleron Riyadh, and a little bit of extra with the pattern hiding her. Yeah, we glimpse Skydal Kane later as well. It does seem to be one of the abilities of the Heroes of the Horn in Teleron Riyadh to be completely uh, unseen. Or in this case, seen by one and rather than two people. Well, I think it's whoever, whoever they want. They can only be seen by people they want to see them. That makes sense. And she is showing herself to Perrin. And I think even here she says, I'm not sure why I showed myself to you. Are you to Perrin? When Brigitte was saying, like, when I saw you before, does she mean at the Battle of Falma? No, I think she's been watching him for some time until I run Riyadh. That's that's what I expected, but then you, you brought up the battle, and I thought maybe that might be what she's referring to. That might be. It could be both, or either. <laughs> oh, you know, she does say, I've met you before somewhere, I think. That might actually be referencing the battle. Yeah, it occurred to me also that she could be referencing some ancient history. Could be. But no, no, I, I, I agree. I think, I think she's talking about the battle there. And then we get, I would say, the first knowledge dump about the Aelfin and the Eelfin. It's how we connect the snakes and the foxes to the Aelfin and the Aelfin. Right. And, you know, this is sort of the first direct confirmation that the game is the same thing as actually going into the, the doorways. And I think that's the only information we ever get about what would happen if someone went through Teleron Riyadh into the world of the snakes and foxes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a quote from RJ saying it's not even possible at some point, but that, that could, you know, again, with all those quotes, I take them with a big grain of salt. So I just, I'm not sure that uh, Robert Jordan ever really figured out what was going on with the Tower of Genji in the World of Dreams, and it never really comes up again. So, yeah. Yeah. I personally head canon. it's impossible to get in there. Gotcha. People are asking about, is Matt currently bound to the horn? He's not unbound until he's killed by Ravine, right? Yeah, the lightning is what binds him. The lightning and then Balefire. Not the hanging. He doesn't actually die. Almost dies. He, he His heart stops for a while. I like to say but that. But he's not dead. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, there's a quote later in the last battle when... Hawkwing says it to Hawkwing, him, right? yeah, because... Matt says, oh, that, that when I died in Rudion, it must have cut me off from the horn. And Hawkwing's like, nope, not that death. It was another death, one you don't even remember. And it was one that Lewis Theron saved you from as well. Because Balefire. Because of Balefire. Because at that point, there was a, there was a period of time where he was, not in, he was dead in the pattern. And even though uh, Ravine's thread was burned out and the effects of what he did were undone for that period of time... Matt was dead, like out of the pattern, you know, totally disconnected, and whatever connection he had with the horn was burned, or was was cut. Who are you? Perrin asks Brigida, but but she seemed to know a lot about the tower and the wolf dream. 
but she was surprised I could talk to Hopper. I've met you before somewhere, I think. I've broken too many of the prescripts already, Archer. Prescripts? What prescripts? A shadow fell on the ground b behind Hopper, and Perrin turned quickly, angry at being caught by surprise again. There was no one there, but he had seen it. The shadow of a man with the hilts of two swords rising above his shoulders. Guidel Kane. Something about that image teased his memory. He's right, the woman said behind him. I should not be talking to you. When he turned back, she was gone. And so I have to wonder if perhaps Brigida's presence and all the breaking of the precepts she does later with the girls was started here by Perrin. Mm -hmm. That if she hadn't broken the precepts with him, she wouldn't have gotten in the habit and she wouldn't have been helping the girls out. And she even implies that his Taveran nature made her do it. The Taveran made me do it. <laughs> the that would be a great excuse for murder. <laughs> Taveran made me do it. Rand walked through a room. <laughs> and so, yeah, Geidel Kane shows up and is in his typical disapproving, this is going to get you in trouble, ripped out of the pattern and yanked into the real world. I wonder if he was right. Don't interfere. Stop. You're breaking the precepts. And we've mentioned the precepts before in terms of who is the agreement with? Who made the precepts? Where did they come from? Who enforces them? The horn is the boss, apparently. Yeah, who, who made the horn? Where did the horn come from? These, And we don't really know. All we really know about these prescripts is that they're not, the heroes aren't supposed to interact unless the horn calls them. They're not supposed to interact with people who are alive. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to help, basically, unless they're called specifically to do so. I think that's actually all I know. There's not a lot to it. The grave is no bar to my call. They don't die, obviously, as part of it. So when they do die, they just go to Teleron Riyadh and wait until they get spun back out. And when they are called by the horn, they seem to be able to shrug off the effects of the one power. Hmm. There's a point where I, I think it's Elaine is asking Brigitte for help, and she's like, well, you're a hero of the horn. You can just sh oh, I saw you just shrug off the effects of the one power in Falma. And she's like, yeah, that only works when I'm summoned by the horn. Right. They're kind of not really there, but sort of are. Right, right. They're they're more like materialized ghosts right. than reborn people. Well-meaning poltergeists. <laughs> so Sean Chan must have been like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> not my hero. I always really enjoyed the image of Arthur Hawkwing attacking his own forces, or those who claim to be his descendants. Yeah, I mean... They are technically his descendants, but he, a guy like that has descendants everywhere, all over the world. You know, Ber Berlaine is one of his descendants, right? That's true. Or That's at true. least her line claims to be. No, I think she definitely is. Berlaine Serpendrag. He opened his eyes to the dim light of dying coals on the mountainside. Gaul was squatting just beyond the edge of the light, watching the night. In the other camp, Fayil was up, taking her turn at guard. The moon hung above the mountains, turning the clouds to pearly shadows. Perrin estimated he had been asleep two hours. I'll keep guard a while, he said, tossing off his cloak. Gaul nodded, and settled himself on the ground where he was. Gaul, the Aeol raised his head. It may be worse in the two rivers than I thought. Things often are, Gaul replied quietly. It is the way of life. The Aeolman calmly put his head down for sleep. Slayer. Who was he? What was he? The shadow spawn at the Waygate, ravens in the mountains of mist, and this man called Slayer in the two rivers. It could not be coincidence, however much he wished it.
Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?